Okay, so thank you all very much for coming along today for this Learning Through Landscapes live webinar. Um, I'm with you today, I'm Gordon McLean, uh, one of the training officers with Learning Through Landscapes. Um, and I'm joined today by Holly and Morig, another two fantastic training officers. Uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves in just a wee minute, um, just as people finish coming into the webinar. So there we go. I think we are looking good. So thank you so much. I'm going to uh, turn off my camera just now and dive into the background and hand over to Holly and Morig. I hope you enjoy and uh, find today's session useful. Cheers. Thank you, Gordon. So yes, welcome to Bushcraft Basics. Uh, my name is Holly Wilmot, uh, Training and Development Officer for Lonely Landscapes. I live up here in the northeast coast of Scotland. Um, often seen gallivanting around the islands and highlands, uh, delivering training to, to educators out there. And uh, yeah, I've got a, a 25 years experience in working in the outdoors. And uh, it's been very broad. It's ranged from an international sea cat guide to delivering forest school to five-year-olds. So yeah, it's quite a big spectrum there and quite a bit of time doing bushcraft activities with children. And it's a wonderful theme to get into, to bring into your time spent outdoors. Um, I've done some uh, advanced bushcraft training as well as forest school training. Um, so yeah, and hopefully with Morag, we'll be, we'll be well equipped to uh, set you on your way. However, this is bushcraft basics. So if you're expecting to learn double-headed axe throwing or how to skin a rabbit, well, I'm sorry, I might have to disappoint you there. We're, we're gonna take this back to a very beginning level. And in this webinar, we'll, we'll split it into a few parts. So initially we'll actually look at bushcraft and what does it actually mean? Uh, and potentially what are those benefits of bringing that in as a theme uh, for your time outdoors? Um, we'll then look at some activities and hopefully give you some ideas to take away with, to, to go and uh, take with children either at home uh, into the garden or into the local parks or into your school grounds or if you're lucky enough into the woodlands uh, nearby. But uh, before we go on and without any further ado I'd like to introduce you to my colleague. Hi there I'm Morag Boyd. I'm based in the Scotland office as well um, and I live in Fife. My background is I've got 25 years experience working as a countryside ranger in many different places around the UK. I've been in Wales, I've been in the Lake District, I've been in the Highlands, um, I'm now in Fife. Um, I, like Holly, I am a training officer for Learning Through Landscapes and I spend a lot of time travelling around. Most of my training's been more in the, the south of Scotland because I'm based down here, but I travel around schools here delivering face-to-face -face training. At the moment, we're doing it slightly differently because of the current situation, so we're doing everything online, which is a bit of a challenge for us, but it's exciting. Um, my other line that I do is, um, alongside my Learning Through Landscapes job, I run a little company that works with school, directly with schools with children, delivering outdoor education, so I regularly have two or three days a week where I'm taking children to the woods and delivering all sorts of different curriculum-related outdoor learning. Okay, so who are learning through landscapes? Now, some of you will have been to some of our previous webinars and you will have some knowledge of who we are, but basically, learning through landscapes are the outdoor learning and play charity for the UK. Um, we do several different things. We publish a large range of outdoor lesson ideas and guidance notes. If you go to our website, you'll find absolutely piles of different lesson ideas. Um, for you to go with if you're working in school. Also, a lot of these ideas at the moment have been directed towards parents educating at home, so they're absolutely accessible to you guys who are not familiar with the more um, formal education um, scenario. We do a lot of training courses and events, and again, our training has somewhat changed in that the training we're doing at the moment is very much online, but we are still delivering training. Um, Normally we do fair face-to-face -face training. We do travel to schools and work with teachers and um, other school staff delivering training, trying to get, build their confidence in getting learning outdoors. We have various projects that uh, offer different, different, offer you different, different things. Um, our big one is a local schools nature grant, which you can apply for if you're a school and you will get um, training, a training session from us and some equipment to enable you to get your, your kids outdoors and get them doing stuff outdoors. We also deliver site visits, which we come along to your school, we have a look around, 
at the grounds, uh, how, this, how the children currently use the grounds. We ask loads of questions. We watch closely what everybody's doing when they're at playtime and when they're at lunchtime. And we can offer you advice following one of these visits regarding how you can make your grounds better for outdoor learning and play. Thank you, Maura. Thank you. And yes, and also to mention, actually, this year is LTL's 30th birthday. Woohoo! And uh, we're lucky enough to have this man, Sir David Attenborough, as, as, one, as our patron. So moving on, bushcraft. What is bushcraft? Let's look at some uh, definitions and see if we can and draw that out. So according to the Collins Dictionary, uh, bushcraft is the ability and experience in matters concerned with living in the bush. A collection of skills and knowledge related to the outdoors. I'm quite liking that one. And down the bottom here, the ability to thrive in your natural environment. Now these are wonderful words. Now often I think when people uh, hear the word bushcraft, they'll associate that straight away with survival. And survival is wonderful if you've got bushcraft knowledge. If you're stuck in, out and alone in the middle of nowhere, bushcraft knowledge will, will surely help you on your way. However, I think bushcraft's a little bit more than that. When I think of survival, I think of a situation of desperation, um, life or death. Well, I'll do absolutely anything um, to survive and use anything to survive. And for me, bushcraft, it goes a little bit deeper than that. It's a bit more holistic. Bushcraft is about really understanding uh, what uh, natural materials, natural resources you've got around you and how you could use them. In some respects, it's almost about limiting all these man-made items that we could take into the outdoors with us and actually just seeing what's there and how we could use it. And I think when you're doing that, you're then actually building up a better knowledge, better understanding, and possibly a bit more respect uh, for the environment around you. So words that really stand out for me in those statements are things like experience and skills, knowledge, ability, and thriving. So moving on. Um, yeah, I said bushcraft is obviously uh, sometimes termed in different ways, survival skills, wilderness living, or woodcraft, but essentially it's all about a deeper sense of learning outdoors. But to call it bushcraft, there is some key elements. And uh, right at the top there, I put plant identification. And when I first got into bushcraft, I wouldn't have necessarily done that. But when I was doing some of my training, my uh, trainer, John Ryder from the Woodcraft School, one of the things he said right at the very start, because I was scratching my head thinking, geez, I'm not a naturalist. This is a, this is a, a, a big subject here. He actually said, you know what, without some plant, some basic plant identification, you don't have bushcraft. Because how are you going to know how to identify what materials you need to use for if you're going to be lighting a fire, what, what's going to make good firewood, or if you're going to do some carving and, and make a cup, what's going to be a nice soft wood perhaps to start with on your journey. So plant ID really is quite, uh, quite key, but it can be quite basic, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Now, moving down the list, natural crafts, it's in the word bushcraft. It's a lot about making stuff, okay? And it's about using some natural materials to make stuff. And uh, that could be at the beginning, it could just be like structures, um, it could be making uh, utility items like pot hangers over a fire. Um, it could be making utensils like uh, pot stirrers or cups. And bushcraft often harks back to our ancestry and perhaps some of our more traditional skills. So like making natural cordage, weaving, felting and leather work. These all come into play. So there's lots of different elements. And then as we go down the list, again, you say bushcraft, somebody that would be like, oh, great, we're going to make fires. And yes, fire is a fantastic uh, topic in bushcraft to get into. Uh, not only are there some uh, ways that you can practice more traditional fire lighting, um, you can actually look at all the things you can do with fire. So, you know, of course, there's cooking, there's warmth, but actually you can prepare materials on the fire for other aspects of, of craft. So fire in itself is a massive subject, and we're not covering it today, but uh, yes, if you, get, if you progress to that, then there's a whole ream of, safety elements and ways that you'd want to, to set that up to make sure you're safe and that the children are safe. Moving down the list, um, some of our essential needs, so our, our basic needs, uh, food, water and shelter, um, and how can we do those in a natural environment. Animal tracks and signs, uh, we're going to touch upon that today. It um, again harks back to perhaps our hunter and gatherer uh, ancestry, but today it's used more in a kind of more of an investigation or perhaps a cons conservation approach. Uh, to being outside. And then also navigation um, comes into bushcraft. Not so much compass and map work, more about how do you orientate yourself. Maybe there's some ways that you can naturally navigate through the landscape. So these are all elements uh, of bushcraft. Now, over to the side here, I, um, let me just move me out of the way here. 
over to the side, I have a picture there of a plant. Now, many of you will probably look at that and go, yes, I know that's a nettle holly. Well, it is a nettle and very common. You'll get them all around uh, your footpaths and your parks at this time of year, growing pretty tall. And a lot of people will look at that and think, wow, those nettles, they're just weeds. But if you put, a bushcraft, put your bushcraft hat on, you start to look at plants a little bit differently. Okay, it stings. And a lot of us will know that because at some point in our lives, we may have touched the nettle and got a nasty sting from it. But when you've got your bushcraft hat on, you might think, okay, how can I actually soothe that sting? And now a lot of you out there are going to go, yep, I'm going to grab a dock leaf and I'll squeeze the juices out of the leaf and that will somehow soothe my sting. Well, in fact, a dock leaf is just placebo. With a little bit of knowledge, you'd know that other plants growing nearby, most likely, would be plantain. And plantain actually has an antihistamine in it. So if you actually squeeze the juices out of the plantain leaf and rub that on the sting, it will actually have some beneficial properties. As well, a nettle, it's a food source. It's super high in nutrients and vitamins. In fact, Gordon was just telling us yesterday, I think it was his, his granddad or his great granddad in the war um, was in a concentration camp and actually managed to survive the winter, uh, which they said was based on them eating nettle soup. So yes, you can make a soup from nettles and uh, a tea, a nettle tea, and you'll often see that in the aisles of the, in the supermarket, in the herb tea section. So we know that it's a good food source. Second that, nettle fibers were traditionally used in clothing. You can actually weave them and make clothing out of it. Cordage is a way, it's a good bushcraft activity, which you can look into. There'll be lots of uh, YouTube films about it. But if you actually take the stem of the nettle and separate the fibers and prepare them in a certain way, you can actually weave them into quite a strong uh, natural cordage. And finally, uh, Morag's gonna to touch upon this a little bit later. You can actually prepare the nettle and able to dye cloth. So that just shows you how broad, just looking at one plant that a lot of us will be quite familiar with, are all the things we can do associated with bushcraft. Now let's look a little bit, uh, I suppose this will appeal to the educators out there and those doing a little bit of home learning. Let's look at what bushcraft actually teaches us. As I say, it's, a, it's quite a broad subject. There's lots of different elements you can bring in, even from a very basic level. Now this word cloud has got some really positive words in it um, that will benefit our learning. So. This, the first one I like, and what stands out for me in bushcraft is reliance, this idea of self-reliance. I think a lot of us humans have this intrinsic kind of feeling that how will I pit against the elements? How will I, how will I cope outside um, when I don't have much? And, and I think that all comes down to this, this ability to, to feel self-reliant. And that gives us confidence. Um, a lot of bushcraft, I say it's very uh, creative. It, it can benefit and improve our motor skills. Um, our responsibility, the picture there is a fire, so being responsible and safe around fire. And as a progression, you quite often get into using sharp edged tools in bushcraft, so being responsible with tools. Um, it also develops our physical competencies. Bushcraft is quite often in remote areas or undulated ground. Um, you're often lifting and moving things, so it's quite a physical and active element to it as well. And as well, all these elements, all these different environments, there's an element of risk. So understanding risk, what are the risk benefits, um, and then start to have a sort of understanding of, of how we can manage those and, and carry on working in those environments. So moving on, there's also some, uh, and I think this is quite important, that, that uh, being outdoors, working with other natural environments can cultivate a better understanding. And excuse me one moment. It gives us a better understanding, a better connection with nature. Um, yes, there's naturalist skills, but I think what I find quite exciting is just, as I say, like with the nettle, and just learning some basic things. And that's more of an ethnobotanic approach. So our human relationship with these plants, what can we actually, how can we use these plants perhaps for our benefit? And I think when you start going down that path, you, as I said before, you start building up a care and an understanding for the environment. So therefore, uh, perhaps uh, your impact and environmental awareness and some issues around that um, could also come into play. Bushcraft quite often is associated with our history. So it could be part of, uh, in school, it could be part of looking at our, our history, our ancestry, some social studies. You could bring that into your bushcraft. Um, and as well as in the curriculum areas, if I take shelter building, which we're going to move on to shortly, you're going to be taken into account measuring, counting, construction, planning, design, um, and again, when you're looking at different natural materials, you might be looking at, or even animals, you're going into science. 
So basically bushcraft uh, can make a normal walk in the park very exciting, full of learning, um, full of adventure and investigation and lots of fun. Now I'm going to pass over to Morag, who's going to go into a little bit about how you can get started and prepare to do some bushcraft activity. Okay. So you've decided you want to do a bit of bushcraft. Where do you start? Okay, before you start, you need to check out if you've got permission to use the site that you have chosen. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do when you get there? Are you going to be building dens just using um, sticks and materials that you find on the ground? Are you actually thinking you want to build something a little bit more permanent, a little bit more elaborate? Are you thinking that you might want to actually maybe cut a few, a few living trees to give you some green wood to work with? If you're going to be damaging live trees and um, other plants, you really, really do need to get permission from the landowner before you start. Also, if you're going to be building more permanent structures, so if you feel that you're going to be regularly using your woodland or your site, um, for bushcraft activities and you want to put up a more permanent um, shelter structure, um, you, you will again need to get permission from the landowner. So have a think about what you want to do and how you want to use the site before you, before you start and then make the decision as to whether or not you have to locate and request permission from the landowner. What do you need? Minimal kit. You need a bag. And when you're starting out, we're talking very, very basic kit. You might decide that you want to take um, a rope or a tarpaulin with you to, to build yourself a little bit of shelter. Tarpaulins are great because you can build shelters with them or you can use them to sit on if the ground is wet. You will need a first aid kit. I would have that in your, in your bag as a matter of routine, just in case you have any accidents. And obviously you need to know how to use it as well. You might find that things like loppers or secateurs are useful if you're going to be cutting up branches that you find in the ground that you might be wanting to length, um, you know, shorten branches to, to build something more, more um, precise. You might not need to do that at all. So very, very basic kit we're looking at here. Um, and then as you move on through um, developing your, your bushcraft skills and developing the skills of the children, you might then start thinking about, actually, we'd, we'd like to take a, a wee saw with us. So one of these wee folding saws, they're, they're perfect to stick in the bag, no damage while you're carrying it, and they're nice and safe and, and covered up until you're using them. You might then want to extend your kit into using knives and, and these sort of other tools, and Holly's going to cover the use of knives later on in, in a little bit of a... A section that we're doing. Um, the other thing that you really really need to think about is your safety while you're there. Both your own safety and the safety of the children that you're working with and also bear in mind that 90% of the time you're going to be working in a public site, you're going to be taking the children to um, a local woodland which is going to be accessed by other people. So think about your own safety and the safety of your group but also be aware that there are other people around and make sure whatever activity you're carrying out you're bearing in mind that other people may get in the way of it and how are you going to manage that. So if you are doing den building, the children will need to be directed to carry or drag their branches in a way that is safe, not just for them, but for anybody else that might be around the area. So keep in mind your own safety alongside that of other site users. And where are you going to go? Well, if you're lucky, you'll have a woodland nearby. And I'm, we're very lucky in Fife because I think every single school I've worked with in Fife has got a woodland within a 15, 20 minute walk of it. So we're very, very lucky here. You might not be so lucky where you live to have a woodland so close. Um, so if you don't have a woodland, you probably will have some sort of a park, um, parks with trees and a lot of parks have good rough woodlandy areas within them. So you should be able to find some sort of usable space within a local park or woodland. You can even take it to the beach if you want. If you live on the coast and you've got a beach nearby, you can adapt your activities to work in a beach. So today's activities are loads and loads and loads of different bushcraft activities and unfortunately we can't cover very many of them today but uh, we will be covering den and shelter building in a little bit of detail and we'll also be looking at dyeing with natural um, resources so using different things that you're going to find when you're out and about to try and dye and extract colour. 
And the third thing we're going to be looking at today is animal tracks and signs. Again, things that you're going to see regularly. Even just walking down the street, you can see signs of animals and their habitation in, in city situations. So loads and loads of interest and fascination for children about what animals are in their environment. Thank you, Morag. So yes, you don't have to be a, a Ray Mears or a Bear Grylls to get into bushcraft. You can take some simple uh, uh, equipment and materials and get started. So let's get into it. Let's go look at shelters, dens and shelters. So a popular activity uh, to get started with. And, and you know why? It's because actually if you take um, children into a, a, sort of a woodland or a park or, or outdoors in the garden, you'll often find without even giving them any instruction, they'll want to make a, a den, a place. Uh, they want to, to build something that they can get a, a sense of it's their own. And uh, that essentially is, is the difference between a den and a shelter. A den can be anything. It's imaginative construction. It can be made out of whatever material the children can find. And it usually doesn't require a lot of direction from the adult. Um, it's sort of going into sort of fancy uh, role play and uh, yeah, imagination. And that's just fantastic. It doesn't actually hark to, to any kind of uh, bushcraft elements of keeping you protected from the elements. It just gives you a nice place. And that could be used, that could be great. It could be used as a nice place to gather the children or something that they'll just develop each time that they, they visit that particular area. Um, for me, the, the idea of a shelter is uh, it gives us a bit of security when, when we're out there. And as adults, if we're taking a group out, uh, the picture on the right there kind of illustrates uh, an example of that by putting up actually a natural, uh, sorry, a man-made structure, a tarpaulin, and we've got a large group gathering area that will actually keep us a bit sheltered if the weather's poor or a little bit wet. We can actually go under that tarpaulin and still carry on with activities. We could be doing some craft activities under there and we could actually prolong our, our time outdoors. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to rush inside. So having some form of, of group shelter uh, can be, that you can put up quickly and take down quickly can be a real advantage. So yes, yeah, shelter, you're looking in bushcraft terms, something that's gonna protect you from the elements. And you'll see the, the children in the front there, they've actually, uh, this might have been a time constraint, they actually just built a, a small shelter and maybe that was actually uh, suitable for that time um, or maybe that time of year, I can remember that time of year, it was a very cold day actually. So maybe we weren't there for too long and they were just building little mini shelters um, underneath the beech tree there. So let's look at natural shelters because this is like what true bushcraft kind of shelters, building a natural shelter. And uh, again, that'll hark back to, to our kind of hunter-gatherer past, if you like. And uh, some folks who are really into bushcraft will, and I have, you know, I have actually spent a, couple, a few nights actually in natural shelters. It's a fantastic thing to do. However, there's a few considerations if you're going to do natural shelters. And one is the environmental impact. And this is becoming a more and more hot topic, I suppose, in bushcraft, because the actual um, requirement to make a, a proper shelter that you could stay in overnight, protected from the rain and other elements, uh, is going to require a lot of materials and a lot of alteration of the, of the forest, if you like, if that's the setting that you're in. So you really need to look at what materials are available. Uh, the den there on the left, I actually built with my family during lockdown. Uh, we have this woodland just behind us, we're quite lucky. Um, but we actually built that from materials that are already lying around from previous shelters built. So if you've already got stuff there, that's, that's great. Or you might gather together some natural materials and say, right, that's my natural shelter building, uh, poles and branches and all that kind of stuff over there, which you can just keep reusing. But something I do see quite a lot um, with natural shelters is that people tend to um, cover them. It's, it's what you choose at the end to cover them with, the thatching, if you like. And if you've got lots of greenery, um, where are you getting that from? And quite often you see people cover shelters with moss, but moss and lichen, they take a long time to establish in the forest. So the environmental impact there won't be so good. Um, perhaps one of the best things you can look for is a recently felled tree with some green branches on it. That might be suitable to, to cut. And as Morag said, if you have permission, that might be absolutely fine to, to cut the branches off that tree to, to put on top of your natural shelter. Um, think about your group size and time. You know, how big is your group and how much time do you have? Do you have enough time to build big shelters? Because everybody's going to want to build their big shelter. Um, so you're going to have to organize the groups, perhaps smaller groups, uh, to build a couple of shelters or one shelter even. Or if maybe you're short of time, why don't you just build little mini shelters instead, like remodel um, a little uh, settlement. So think about time and, and, and group size. And uh, finally, just a bit more about safety. More like I said about dragging sticks, watching out for low level branches that could poke eyes. Uh, and this is where tools will come in handy, some lock secateurs or some loppers just trim those, those little branches back. Another bit of safety is you'll notice that 
both those two structures on your screen have one main pole, the ridge pole, if you like, that is going to support everything else that's thrown upon it. So when the children actually put that in place, the best thing that you can do is go and test it for strength. And what I like to do is actually cut my uh, hands around it and put my weight light on it and see if I can actually hang on that. And uh, <laughs> quite often you'll find it actually breaks. It might be a bit rotten. It could be lying around on the forest floor for a while. So just watch that uh, and make sure it's uh, strong enough to, to support all the sticks and all the branches and all the other debris that the children are likely to find to put on that. Now, two different structures that I've got in, in front of you there. Um, they're very classic sort of bushcraft shaped natural shelters. The one on the left is a lean-to shelter. And as you can see, it's only making sort of one side, one wall, if you like, um, and it creates quite a sort of open shelter, which is uh, quite suitable for, for groups because you get uh, quite a few people sitting in there. And that's another thing as well, is that um, think about the height of your shelter. It doesn't have to be standing height. You don't have to be having a wee party in there. Um, it's fine if it's just a bit higher than perhaps you sitting down. And that way, again, you're going to use less or need less resources and prepare um, less si smaller size resources, if you like, to actually build the shelter. Um, the shelter to lean to there, it, I didn't have the luxury of having small branches, bees sticking out from the tree where I could slot that uh, the cross beam. Um, I actually had to tie that on and uh, not tying is an activity you can, uh, we can look at in just a second. And on the right, there's a different type of shelter, um, a debris shelter, uh, where the, the beam is just resting on a stump and you have these kind of ribs of sticks going down either side, a kind of classic A-frame shape, like a traditional tent. Um, and then debris is kind of put over those. And the one in the picture might be small enough for a, a small child just to crawl inside, uh, even though a bunch of children might have made it. So it's a fantastic activity for, for kids to kind of organize themselves, a bit of teamwork, and, uh, and hopefully they'll, they'll produce a nice shelter at the end. Okay, let's look at some other examples of dens and shelters. Again, this is a little bit of a, a little cheat, I suppose, but you can use man-made uh, tarpaulins. And the advantage here is that they're lightweight, they, they tend to be waterproof and quick and easy to put up and quick, and easy, quick to take down as well. But they can also create that nicer place. Um, an interesting example there, I've got some teachers on the left who were uh, uh, taking a, a playground structure and putting tarps up around that, which they, they thought was great fun. In the middle here, we've got a parachute and parachutes make quite nice shelters um, because you can actually uh, curtain them up and you can actually tie them off to the side and just keep reusing them. Um, and you can create a sort of semi-permanent kind of wood, uh, bushcraft kind of camp, if you like, underneath them. Uh, so in the picture there, I might think that's a great gathering space. How could, we, how could I and the children enhance that by uh, perhaps making some um, rustic furniture, some wooden stumps, maybe in a fire pit? Um, but equally so, it could just be an area of the school ground or garden where you could go for, to do some storytelling or for some other crafts. And over on the right there, some teachers putting up a tarp from school grounds. Um, again, just a nice quick, uh, shelter to put up, a gathering place where they could do some activities and they've obviously put a, a tarp on the floor there to, to, to keep the bums dry. Okay, this is going more I suppose into dens but at home you can use what you can find around the house. There's some fantastic examples there of a cardboard house and uh, on the right there just using maybe some wooden pallets and some blankets um, and again we're going in more into the realms of, of den making but uh, you know they could reenact um, perhaps more bushcraft themed activities, hunter gatherer activities from that. Okay, so let's just run through a, a few um, activities that I, I've done with, with children related to shelter. Uh, number one here, discovering the past. Um, a, a couple of years ago in Scotland, it was the year of history, heritage and archeology. span And working with some schools um, came up with a, a sort of bushcraft program. And this particular, um, that was in the coastal areas or in the forest. And this was on the coast and in the school they were looking at the stone age and uh, one example of that was they were looking at uh, one of the most famous neolithic settlements we've got in the united kingdom which is scarabray up in orkney so i thought well you know what why don't we learn about how the people lived at that time and uh, and all these different aspects if you see in their in their home the, the fires and their beds and all that kind of thing and perhaps some of the tools they used and why don't we recreate that remodel it on on the shore which we did there so a great, a great activity that supports looking at our history and uh, creativity. Um, on the right there, exploring popular themes. Wolf Brothers are uh, on many schools reading lists about uh, a hunter-gatherer, a young boy and his wolf. And again, why not take aspects of that and bring it to life outdoors um, related to bushcraft. And having done a lot of bushcraft activities with, with kids, they'd often come out and go, oh, Holly man, this is just like Minecraft. It's just like Minecraft. And I thought, well, you know what? 
let's make it like Minecraft. So took some elements of the game and uh, recreated that outside uh, as a sort of a uh, fun holiday program. And the kids loved it. They absolutely loved it, bringing that to life. Uh, just a few more, touched upon knot time. So a great skill, um, learning a few knots. And in particular, um, maybe if you're going down that route, maybe learn uh, two or three knots that would support perhaps your shelter building or other aspects of bushcraft and uh, keep practicing those and learn how to apply those knots. Where would they be useful? Um, number four, TP Teddy. So let's say you're at home, you don't have access to woodland, you haven't got these lots of natural material around you. Uh, and this is particularly good for, for younger children. My, my uh, three-year-old boys loved it. Um, just grab their favorite fluffy toy, take it outside and say, guys, why don't we try and build a little pet, a little shelter for them? Let's grab some sticks and leaves and uh, see if we can make a little, uh, a little shelter. And in no time, they're building a wee village for, for their wee teddies. And uh, another activity there is uh, Waterproof Shelter Challenge. I've done this with older children. And again, a lot of these resources are on the LTL website. But I've done this with older children where you just can give them some limited materials, some poles, some tent pegs, perhaps tarpaulin, and uh, send them off, give them some time limit perhaps, and then you come along in a little while and chuck a bucket of water over them and uh, see how waterproof their actual shelter is. And they'll love that. It's a little bit competitive, it's a little bit of a challenge, and, and it's lots of fun. So there you go. I hope that was some uh, useful activities for you to, to take away. And I'm going to pass you back to Morag. Right, you'll see that I've now moved from a kitchen table to my kitchen floor. Um, this is for activity that I'm going to show you how to do very shortly. Okay, so we're going to start off looking at colour and dye, and we're going to be thinking a little bit about how you can use um, things that you find in the woods to get colour out of them into, into different fabrics and that sort of thing. So we're going to start off with thinking about nettles. Now Holly touched on nettles earlier um, and he suggested that, that nettles have got many, many, many different uses. Um, nettles are fantastic for dyeing things. You get a fantastic sort of yellowy green colour out of nettles. But the problem with nettles is that they sting. So the first thing you need to think about is not getting stung so make sure you've got gloves and long sleeves on before you get in amongst those nettle bushes and picking nettles but when you pick nettles the strange thing is if you keep them for for an hour or two the sting kind of deteriorates they stop being quite so stingy which is fantastic um, and that makes everything a little bit a little bit easier to use okay so pick a great big bunch of nettles make sure you've got your long sleeves and your gloves on and put them in a container with a little bit of water and then you want to mash them up with a mallet or a rock or at the end of a, of a, a, a large stick, um, maybe a rolling pin, something like that. Give them a really, really good mash until they're really pulped into a green, green mass of um, kind of mashed up leaves. You will then probably want to strain them. So if, if you were thinking about doing this activity before you went to the woods, you would take along with you the kit that you need. So you're going to need a bowl or a basin, you're going to need something to mash them with, and you're going to need something to strain them with. And in fact, you're probably going to need a second bowl if you're pouring the water through some through a strainer to collect the water on the other side. So you could use a strainer or a sieve, or you could use some fabric and just pour the water into a fabric, bunched up into a bag and squeeze it through into your container underneath. And then you should have a nice bowl full of kind of greeny, greeny coloured water for you to put your, your fabric in. Get your fabric into it, give it a good mix around and then leave it. And you might want to leave it for quite some time. You want to stir it every now and again to make sure that the colour soaks in evenly. And you might want to leave it overnight and go back in the morning and have a look and see what colour you have got. Another activity that's really, really easy to do, and I've done this many, many times with children, is painting with soil. If you go out when you're out in the woods or you're up on the hill or you're in the park or you're in your garden, have a look at the soil. You're going to see loads of different colours in different places. In some areas here in Fife, we've got a very, very rich black soil in the low levels um, where, where we've got really good arable farmland a really rich black soil. If you go up onto the hills, we've got a red sand so sandy soil, which is completely different colour. So I go around and I collect up little, little bags of all the different colours of, of soil and I bring them back and I stick them into a wee bowl 
add a good squish of PVA glue and some water and mix it thoroughly and then get your paintbrush and you can start painting with it. And you can paint onto paper, you can paint onto rocks, you can paint onto wood. Um, paint onto fabric too, it works very, very, very well on fabric, but remember if you do paint it onto fabric, don't wash it, it's not permanent. Okay, so moving on now to another way of getting colour out of plants, and I'm going to demonstrate this just now um, in a moment, but I'll just take you through what you need for this. You need some fabric, some kitchen roll, a mallet or a smooth rock, and a hard surface. And then you need to go and collect yourself some fresh leaves. Now I'm going to show you now what to do, so I'm just going to stop sharing this screen and hopefully I'm going to be able to direct my computer down so you can see my, my um, work surface there. Guys, can you see that okay? Is that all right? Yep, that looks good, Marek. Perfect. Okay, so what I've got here is I've got a block of paper because I'm working on my kitchen floor and I don't want to smash my tiles up. So think about where you're doing your... your um, your hapazome activity before you start. I would do it outside if you could, but it's kind of difficult to do a webinar from outside my house. So I'm in my kitchen and I've got a block of paper and on top of the block of paper, I've got some kitchen paper. And then on top of that, I've got a piece of white fabric. Okay, I'm gonna pick up my leaves now. As I said before, nettles, these are nettle leaves and I'm now handling them. There's no sting left. They've been in a bag for about two or three hours. There's no sting left on them. So I'm completely fine handling those. She says that stung slightly. Okay, I've got some ferns here. Now, what I'm doing today, and I tried this earlier, is I've got a whole different range of leaves because different times of years of the year, you get different, different amounts of dye out of the leaves. And some leaves will shed very, very little dye whatsoever. Other leaves will shed quite a lot. I've also tried some petals. I found a, a big poppy leaf, poppy petal nearby while I was out with my dog this morning, so I picked up that poppy petal. I don't know if it's going to let any colour out or not. And lastly, I put this is this is not from a tree. This is a from a, a dock leaf that was growing on the ground. Now I'm going to cover this up with some kitchen roll. Now the reason I've done it with kitchen roll, what you can do is you can have two layers of kitchen roll um, and just sandwich the leaves in between them. But the reason I've done fabric underneath and kitchen roll on top is just so that we can see if there's any difference between um, using leaves and using uh, fabric and kitchen roll. Now, if you just hold on, with, bear with me a second. I'm going to mute myself because this is going to get noisy. She must be almost there, and she's back. Okay, so let's open this up and see what we've got. I don't know whether any dye is going to come through at all today. There we go. So you can see, I don't know if you can see, but you can see on the, the, the fabric there, on the, the paper tile that was on the top, there is some from the ferns, we've got a lovely imprint of a fern running up this side. We've got precisely zero from the nettles, although we've got a little tiny bit of, of nettle dye on the, the fabric. So if I carried on bashing for another few minutes there, I might as well have got more, more colour. I've got no colour out of my dock leaf at all. I wonder if we've got any colour out of my, my poppy petal. Nothing has come out of the poppy petal. You got you got love you got love live demonstration, eh, Mark? <laughs> it's great, isn't it? It's great. I knew this morning that's possibly not exactly the right time for you to be doing this. Sometimes so, so. here you get different amounts of colour coming out of the leaves, and very early in the spring you get a lot of colour coming out of the leaves. Um, we're probably too late into the summer now, and um, the leaves have toughened up, so we're not getting quite so much colour coming out of them. There's a lovely opportunity there for for you to do some investigation with the kids. Do your hapazome right at the beginning when the leaves are just appearing, then try it again in the summer and then try it again in the autumn. Try it again when the leaves are coming down when they're already already drying up and coming down. You can see how much moisture, how much colour um, and the variations in the colours that you'll get as well as the, as the, um, the, the, the months and the years move on. Okay, so I'm going to hand back to Holly now. Um, Great. 
Thank you very much, Mara. Thank you for that. Wonderful. Um, so our, our third section of activities we're going to look at is animal tracks and signs. And for this, I'm actually going to share with you um, a, a little film that I made actually just on my phone just the other day for this, for this webinar. So don't expect a Steven Spielberg production. Um, but the reason why I did that is because I thought, what better way to, to show you um, about some of those clues that you look for when you're trying to discover what the animals you have are around you, because you quite often won't see them, especially if you're out with kids in the middle of the day. So what are some of those little, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's great. You can get the kids to become a little investigators and, and, and have a th think about what these clues are um, and then see what they can discover. So um, yeah, as I said before, traditionally, uh, animal tracks and signs was a hunting skill, um, but nowadays it's used for perhaps, a, well, as a, as a sort of fun and bushcraft activity, but for monitoring wildlife um, and probably more sort of conservation approach. But anyway, let me show you the film and then we'll chat about some activities uh, related to that. So let me bring this up. Okay, I'll show you the film now. We're now going to go on a whistle stop tour looking at some of those methods of animal tracks and signs. The first is probably the most simple. It's just to sit down, take some time out and just listen and look around. When you're walking along a footpath, look out for any sort of disturbances and smaller trails that might have been created by an animal. These are quite fun to investigate and see if you can figure out where the animal has actually been. If you find some damp ground, preferably sand or mud, look closely because you might find some animal tracks in it. I've got one here and the best thing to do is actually draw a circle around the track and that way no children will actually trample it and then I've actually marked it with a stick. I wonder if you can guess what animal this was. Another animal sign you'll probably find is animal poo. It creates a lot of excitement and a lot of discussion, but it's actually quite good because it can help you identify an animal, um, identify what the animal's been eating. Right here we've got round droppings that look quite fibrous. They're a little bit small for a deer, so my bet would be a bunny. When you're walking perhaps in the woods, look carefully at the ground because you might find some animal feeding signs. Down here I've got some chewed up pine cones. As you can see, all the outside edge of the pine cone has been stripped off. And this was done by a squirrel. What the squirrel does is picks up the pine cone and takes off all these scales that are known as baracks and eats the seeds that are inside. And they leave these, these cores all around the forest floor. See if you can get the children to all find one each. Don't just walk by tree stumps. They're often used by animals as either feeding tables or toilets. And in this case, the squirrel's been back feeding on the pine cones. They like to use the high up spot as a vantage place in case there's any predators nearby. Another sign to look out for is physical evidence of the animal. And this could take shape in a number of ways. It could be fur, feathers, bones, skulls. And over here, I've even found an egg, which I believe belongs to a pheasant. Animal homes can take all sorts of different shapes and sizes. In here, this old tree, right at the back, we can see a small hole which looks like it was created by a small mammal. Quite often you'll see homes uh, in the shape of burrows or nests. Animal homes can be actually a quite a temporary measure. Down here we've got a deer bed and I know this because the moss has been slightly dispersed and you can see this slightly damper, darker patch of ground. Also the evidence up here on the tree trunk, if you look really closely you'll be able to see lots of hairs where the deer has actually scratched its back. There's been a murder. It looks like a pigeon was predated here. It's a classic kill site when you've got a scattering of feathers. One thing to do is actually look at the tips of the feathers and see if they're intact or not. Now these are pretty intact, which looks like the feathers might have been plucked. So that would have been from a bird of prey. If the tip here has been ripped or torn, that could have been from something like a fox or a cat, something with sharp teeth. Tracks and science is actually a massive subject and I could have expanded on all the areas that we've looked at today. I hope that's given you enough to, to get started uh, and to, to go out with kids and uh, build up that investigation, that inquiry and look for some of those different tracks and signs that I've shown you today. Okay, so there you go. I, uh, I hope you find that uh, useful. Um, let me just switch this off and I'll go back onto the PowerPoint. Um, two seconds, folks. Okay, just share that with you, come back to the 
need to move around a little bit. Oh, sorry, folks. Okay, sorry, I'll try that again. One second. Um, it's got to be a technical glitch somewhere. <laughs> there we go. Oops. Okay, there we go. That's fantastic. Great. So I hope you enjoyed the little film there. I just wanted to add at the at the end. Um, I was going to add at the end of the film there that if you are out uh, looking at say animal poo or kill sites and all that kind of thing, then I would suggest either using a stick to investigate or perhaps wearing disposable gloves. But whatever, if you're doing any of these activities, really. Uh, definitely give your hands a thorough wash um, afterwards. We've all become pretty good at that of late. So uh, definitely when, when you're looking at those types of items. So um, yeah, so this teaches the children to discover wildlife around them. So let's go back uh, and think about some of those aspects in the film and some activities related. So first of all, going back to the footprints, um, a, a great activity to do is try and kind of capture your own footprints. And one way to do that is to take an old tray, if you like, an old baking tray, and perhaps uh, finding or creating a substrate that uh, the animal footprint will, will show up best in. So sand or, or mud, or well, if it's snowing, fantastic, the snow is great. Um, but if you get it on a tray, smooth it out with a ruler or a trowel, and make sure it's slightly damp, and then perhaps position it in the corner of a garden or school grounds. Um, you could entice the animal with maybe some animal food, uh, sorry, cat or dog food or some peanut butter, if you like, uh, to try and draw them a bit closer, uh, perhaps tempt them to, to walk over the tray and leave the footprints. And if you manage to get some footprints, don't be too disheartened if you, if you initially find that nothing's actually walking over your, your tray of sand and mud. Move it perhaps to somewhere different, a different uh, part of the grounds or a different part of the garden and you might get some, some results then. And then you can look at actually those tracks and some great resources out there, some nice visual resources. Um, the Field Study Council has some very, uh, very nice visual uh, references for that. And then you can perhaps look at things like how many toes does the, the animal have, um, how big's the footprint to measure the size of the footprint. And that way, if you go through some of these things, you can actually narrow it down to what the animal might be. Second activity um, is, a, is a fun tracking game. So going back to animal trails, it's just simply, um, you could split the, split the children into two groups and depending on their age and their responsibility and how well they know the area, if you've set boundaries for the area uh, or you might need to have an adult with each group, it's entirely, you, you can figure that out. Um, but essentially one group will head off with a stick and as they go along, they'll just make little marks on the ground um, as a trail for the, for the other group. The other group will have a time and then they'll set off and then they'll try and track the, the initial group with the stick. So stick drag game. If you've got some younger children or you're not leaving any good marks on the ground, some alternatives are just making little arrows out of perhaps stones or pine cones or even flour um, and try and track each other and swap over. So it's a great fun game for observation skills and perhaps a bit of orientation as well. Where are we in the, in the outdoors and, and uh, how do we find the other group, how do we track them? A third activity um, is called Best Nest. Great at this time of year with lots of bird activity around us. Um, but you can see if the children can recreate a bird's nest. Now, obviously, a bird used their, their beak and their claws to build a, a nest, but uh, the children aren't probably going to be able to do that. But they can find some natural materials, try and weave nest shape together and see how they go. Um, a couple of things that I've done with this activity uh, to kind of progress it a little bit further. One would be to get some hot water and a thermometer uh, and maybe some little bottles like the shampoo bottles you get in the hotel, so little small bottles, and uh, leave one bottle out with the hot water and then put another bottle in each nest if you've made a few. Um, maybe cover the nest with something, uh, perhaps you've got a little toy bird or something like that. And then after a little while, they'll leave the nest for a while, come back and then measure the temperature again and see how well your, your nest actually insulates uh, and keeps that water warm. So how efficient is your nest? The other thing you could do is get the children to throw the nest in the air and see when it lands, if it breaks into pieces or not, how strong is the nest? So you could do a bit of experimentation with that. Tell them before you do that because you might get some tears otherwise. So there's just a few activities related to some of those animal tracks and signs that I hope you find useful. So folks, we're actually coming to, to towards the end of this webinar. Uh, I hope it's given you lots of thought and inspiration uh, to what you could maybe do with bushcraft um, and activities you can, you can do in different areas. And, and as I'd like to say, as we did at the start, this is just the basics, it's the beginning. So get out there and try some stuff out. There's some wonderful resources. There's a few here. Uh, our own website's got some fantastic stuff for you to look at. Um, in many different subjects, uh, not restricted obviously to bushcraft, loads of different su subjects um, for outdoor learning. And following the other, some of the ones that uh, 
that I find quite useful, Muddy Faces, the OWL um, website, OWL Scotland has some good stuff on tool use if you press for that. And as I said, the field study of cancer has got some nice special aids. So what I'd like to do is um, just move on here and I think I'm going to pass over to Gordon. Welcome back, Gordon. Hello, thank you so much for that, guys. And um, just pulling myself back out from behind the scenes there. Uh, that was really, really great. Loads of uh, useful information there. And I think you have covered a, a huge amount. Uh, interestingly, uh, quite a few of the questions that I have been sent, you have actually answered live. So that is uh, that's always uh, a good sign. Um, so one of the, so a couple of the, the questions that I'll just mention uh, and uh, go back over. One was about uh, age groups and suitability of ages and can we do this in the early years um, and I think that yeah absolutely you, you've both touched on things that are very accessible uh, by early years groups uh, and right through uh, there is there's no real age limit obviously you might uh, adapt some of the things that you're doing um, but it is accessible by all um, and another question that came in towards the end was about handling feathers and touching feathers and picking them up and I think Holly, you touched on that as well there. Um, that absolutely, but let's make sure that we give our hands a really good scrub. Uh, and as you said, we've been getting a lot of practice in on that. As I said, it's, it's interesting that one came up, Gordon, actually, because uh, I was actually working with some teachers in the school and um, the teacher had some real reservations about using feathers for some, some art piece that she was doing, um, some natural feathers that the children had discovered and, and uh, she, she wouldn't allow them to to pick them up so she went and bought some uh, some plastic feathers from a from a hobby uh, and craft shop um, but I think in that in that respect if you look at a little bit of common sense if you're going to handle feathers and um, as said in, the, in before it's really about just uh, washing the hands uh, thoroughly afterwards and, and making sure they're not putting them anywhere near their mouths um, and obviously if the feathers are still attached to a carcass then don't pick it up <laughs> that would be my advice excellent um, and I've just had uh, a couple of questions here regarding uh, resources and um, well, uh, the website. So just to, to say the, the website address will be on screen in just one little second. Uh, and another question here uh, regarding opening of schools um, in Wales, but I, I guess this could go for, for any, um, as we, we all know that we are in a very different situation at the moment. So we have recently published some um, information that we have collated. Uh, so this information is information from uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, um, the UK government, and I believe there are links and resources from CDC in America as well. Uh, and there's a few different pages and we will be adapting and adding to these uh, as we go, as we receive more information. Uh, we all do know, I think, that it's a, an ever-changing situation that we are in at the moment. So please do head over to ltl.org.uk for more information on this and to see the resources that we have on there. Uh, and I'll just scroll. Um, so we're just coming towards the end of our uh, time here um, Holly do you want to touch on uh, using tools tools where I mentioned at the start so I know that we have uh, hopefully made it quite clear that you can go and do bushcraft with very very limited resources absolutely absolutely Gordon I mean you really you really don't need tools I, as I think one of the most important bits of kit you can take with you is a first aid kit um, but there's loads of activities you do not need to, to, to think about sharp edge tools um, you can go and harvest um, what you can find that's already fallen on the forest floor, if you like, or in the, in the grounds around you. Um, however, uh, an element of bushcraft is inevitably um, using sharp edge tools, and in particular a knife. And I think knives got a lot of stigma, um, of course, associated with them, and rightly so. Um, we've got to be very cautious, and there are some definite laws around the use of knives. However, let's not forget that like, knife is actually a tool. It's a, it's a tool that we are familiar with in our kitchens, and it's a very much part of, sort of bushcraft and, and preparing, it's used for preparing um, resources uh, and for making crafts. So by all means, that's somewhere where you potentially could get to. It's a bit like fire as well. It's, it's to be built into a progression, if you like, of bushcraft activities. And uh, if you then for if you're gonna start bringing in those elements, you're gonna have to really look at your, your risk assessment, your risk benefit analysis around that, uh, and make sure you've got some good clear guidelines um, about that and also that you feel that you have got 
that confidence and competence to, to be able to use those, those skills with a group. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Building it up over time. Uh, and I'm going to have a, a final question for you both, if that's okay. Um, and then I will just cover how to get in touch with us. There's a few questions coming in, um, so I'll cover that in three seconds. But what is your favourite, or what would, let me just read this, what would be your most memorable or rewarding experience when working in bushcraft? Um, it might be difficult to pin down just one, but uh, I'll pass that over to, to you guys. Well, <laughs> Marag, you can go first on that one. <laughs> I'm having to think. <laughs> I think, you know, for me, I think, um, oh, you know, for me, it's, I think as a small child, um, I, I was probably only about, uh, I, get, I grew up in a wee island off the west coast of Scotland. And as much as, maybe it's not so much bushcraft, but it's about being out in the elements and that kind of, how do you pit yourself against the elements? And I, one of my favourite things was to, to do was to go out when it was absolutely lashing down with rain. Uh, I'd wear my full waterproofs and my wellies and you'd only see this much in my face and I'd go up to the, the hill which is behind the cottage on the wee island all thick full of heather and I used to just lie down in the, in the heather and feel sheltered and just listen to the rain pattering and pounding off the waterproofs and I'd feel pretty safe but I'd feel quite strong, feel really good in that moment and uh, that's a, that was a lasting memory of, of, of my childhood. For me, um probably wasn't actually a bushcraft activity. We, we were in the woods with the school and we were, we were looking at animal homes. So I guess technically it is bushcraft. We were looking at looking for signs of animals. Um, we were looking at animal homes. We were finding dens. Um, we were finding areas of flattened grass that, that we kind of thought, wonder what that is. Um, and we were finding little holes that we were thinking maybe mice or rats or, or such creatures lived in. And as we were, we were walking through the woods finding these, we actually found a deer that, that emerged from the woods right, right in front of us. And it was it was so exciting because these children were, were children from an urban school in, in Kirkcaldy. And most of them had hardly ever been to the woods before. And most of them didn't even really believe that there were big wild animals living in the woods. And when they saw that deer, that was the most exciting thing that had happened to some of them in, in ever, quite possibly. So it was really, really, really rewarding. And I still remember the looks on their faces. It was fabulous. Can I, can I can I just can I just touch upon something quickly there? That was that was brilliant. But uh, can I just tell you why I use this picture here in the in the on the screen? Um, this was actually one of my most rewarding experiences with bushcraft. And this was a this was quite a quite a lengthy bushcraft program I was doing with a support for learning department in a secondary school up here in the northeast coast of Scotland. And uh, we got to the point where we we're doing some uh, man-made shelters, so we we're doing hammocks and bashers. And uh, this 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 guy here, he'd, he'd never been in a hammock before. And we got him in his hammock and he just started giggling and laughing. And you know what? He had us all in pieces. The absolute joy, the sensation of lying in his hammock uh, just got him and it got all of us too. So that was a brilliant moment. Brilliant. Thank you both. Uh, and I suppose I'll touch on a couple of mine just really quickly. I know we're at five o'clock now. So many amazing, rewarding experiences being out and about when I'm, if I'm going camping or walking. And it's just that being at one and the, the peacefulness uh, of nature and just surrounding yourself in that is amazing. But again, some of my professional moments as well. So when working with parents, families, young children and taking them out and it's similar to the experience that you've both just shared there, it's seeing that joy on other people's faces as well, seeing them connect to nature and get really fired up and excited um, about nature and really beginning to develop that relationship with it um, and maybe seeing a spark of that care uh, within nature as well. Um, so we are just going to have to wrap up just now. I'm sure the three of us could sit here and gab about bushcraft uh, for the rest of the day, but I'm afraid we are at five o'clock. So thank you so much for joining us. Please do get in touch. Um, we are with questions about who do we work with. We work with lots of different groups, so whether you're early year settings or primary or secondary, um, again, different project programs, uh, training opportunities that we have. So please get in touch directly with our website. But we would like to leave you with a, a kind of final thought. Uh, and this is from one of the, the famous bushcrafters, Ray Mears. Uh, the great thing about bushcraft is that wherever you go, the skills go with you. Uh, and I just think that is a brilliant uh, quote from Ray Mears. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got loads of resources, uh, free resources to download on our website. So come visit us online 
get in touch. We would love to come out and visit you as well. Uh, and do take care. And thanks again for joining us. Thank See you, everyone. Thank you. Take care.